Um, so it's a great pleasure to um, welcome um, Professor um, Alina Pilavicentio, who is the Chair of uh, Natural Language La um, and Processing at the Department of uh, Computer Science at the University of Sheffield. And uh, she's also affiliated with the University of Informatics at the Federal University of Rio Grande of uh, the Sul in Brazil. As you've read from the, her abstract, we're going to hear something really interesting, computational modeling of idiomaticity in language. Uh, the floor is yours, Selena. Thank you. Uh, while um, to motivate this talk, here is the uh, open is not ready for tastes in Spanish. And here are some of the options that um, of possible meanings for this, um, this idiomatic expression. And I'm uh, going to skip to the final answer, so if you've had some time to actually think about this, um, and it's to be angry. So I don't know if it matched your expectations or not, but this is what it means. And this is to give you an idea of how difficult it is um, to interpret these expressions because their meaning is a combination of the words, but not their literal meaning. Um, and, uh, for example, if you're a non-native speaker of English and somebody tells you that they went on a wild goose chase, you may think that they were chasing ducks in a pond, but what the, mean, the meaning of this idiom is actually to go in a hopeless pursuit. So as native speakers of a language, you don't even realize how interesting they are. Uh, and when you go to second le language learning classes, is that you think, okay, I'm, I'm really smart, I can really understand this in my native language, and you appreciate um, how uh, interesting they are. But for technology, they are still a challenge. But if we look at machine translation, and I try to translate, he went on a wild goods chase to Portuguese, uh, the translation would be literal, that he chased the wild geese, and it wouldn't make sense in Portuguese. And for Spanish, it would be the same. It would translate literally to uh, Spanish. And if I wanted to do some um, uh, text simplification, I, I may end up with a sentence that completely lost its meaning, that somebody chased geese. Well, uh, what I wanted to, to tell was about a fruitless pursuit. And if I do information retrieval, I, I get all these lovely images of birds flying and so on. So somewhere we got lost in translation and uh, multi-word expressions and specifically idiomatic expressions are still an open problem in NLP. This uh, quote is from 2001 and well, uh, now uh, 21 years after, uh, they are still an open problem for NLP. So. Uh, the, um, the way we can think about idiomatic expressions is that they are recurrent uh, combinations that are formulaic and that need to be treated as a unit at some level of linguistic description. So they, they are usually interpretations or concepts that cross word boundaries. So there are multiple words or, or lexemes or concepts involved um, and uh, they um, can be seen in different types of expressions. Like, for example, in verb and noun combinations like rock the boat and see stars, lexical bundles like I don't know whether, and compound nouns like cheese knife and rocket science. And depending on uh, the, the theoretician that you talk to, their uh, definition of multi word expressions is going to be a bit more uh, comprehensive or a bit less. Um, but they happen in all languages and in all domains. From technical domain um, and domain specific language, like deep learning, artificial intelligence, to literature and arts. So, if you go back to, to any book from now on, you are going to start seeing all this, uh, these expressions are everywhere, including in the works of Shakespeare. He's the master of the idiomatic expressions. So, you have even um, titles of uh, Shakespeare's plays, which are multi word expressions like all's, all's well that ends well. And um, they, they, they can be seen everywhere and they are very frequent uh, in daily language. So it's estimated that around four multi-word expressions are produced by minutes of discourse by native speakers. So, and um, they are said to be of the same order of magnitude that single words in the metal lexicon of a native speaker. 
And uh, they also make up for a large proportion of technical language. So if you work on a specific domain, you are going to have seen um, specific terms. And they have faster processing time for native speakers compared to, to compositional non-expressions. Um, so um, what's the challenge for processing them for multi-word expressions and for human learners? It's uh, that they uh, have reduced semantic compositionality. So not always you'll be able to infer the meaning of an expression from the words that are employed in the expression. Like we saw, for example, with the, um, uh, the hot ovens or the wild goose chase. And uh, the, there are degrees of idiomaticity. So a brick wall, for example, is a wall that is made of brick. There is an implicit relation there. Uh, made of that is not uh, explicitly realized. Um, and for another compound like cheese knife, you have another different implicit relation. So it's not a knife that is made of cheese, but it's a knife for cutting cheese, right? And if you go even further for something like a lawn shark, it's not a shark for lawn, but a person who loans at high interest rates. So when you start thinking about all that is implicit in these multi-word expressions and these idiomatic expressions, it's a really uh, um, rich and uh, wide spectrum of compositionality from um, more uh, for fully compositional uh, terms that you can infer the meaning of the multi word, like brick wall, to something like a grandfather clock, which is partially compositional because it's, it's a type of clock not only owned by grandfathers but can be owned by anybody, uh, to cloud nine, which is to be in a state of bliss or happiness where, and where the words don't give you any clue about the meaning of the expression. Um, interestingly for us, uh, idiomaticity has been also linked to limited variability of this expression. So the more fixed a given expression is um, in the various uh, occurrences that it's going to have, the more idiomatic it, um, it, it's assumed to be. Um, and what's the problem for um, te techniques for, from natural language processing? One of the big issues is that our uh, techniques, they assume the principle of compositionality. That you can build the meaning of any new unseen sentence from the meanings of the individual parts or the words that are there. So if I say to you, oh, the mouse is running from the brown cat, you imagine that there is a mouse, there is a cat, the cat is brown somehow, there is a running event. Uh, but if I say Jane bought a grandfather clock, you know, there is Jane, there is a buying event and there is a clock, but what do you do with the grandfather there? So, um, multi-word expressions, um, they um, provide several challenges for us. So, given a, now, given a, a sequence of words, first of all, you have to understand if there is a multi-word somewhere in that sentence or not. And if there is, then you need to try to determine how conventional or how uh, Syntactically flexible it is, so that if you are generating, you are not generating something that sounds unnatural to a native speaker. And then you have to determine how idiomatic it is. So if you're doing machine translation, you are translating the right concept. Um, and um, finally, you have, if you want to do any kind of inference, you really have to understand the meaning of the expression. So how do we do that as humans? I'm going to briefly uh, mention to you one, uh, one of the um, corpus um, studies that we did comparing children um, for particle constructions with adults. We looked at uh, the child's uh, English corpora and we compared the verb particle constructions that were used in the uh, sentences produced by children and the sentences that children were seeing there. And what we found was that there was a really high um, a correlation uh, 0.63 candle score between the VPC uh, particle constructions that uh, the two groups were used. And when we looked at the verbs, we saw there is there was even a greater agreement. So the groups of verbs that they were employing these constructions was quite limited. Uh, and when we looked at the top 10 preferred verb particle constructions in the children's um, data and in the adults' data, we saw that it was basically the same top 10, um, just the order was slightly different. And the most salient difference was that children seem to use a lot of fall down and uh, adults were using a lot of pick up. But this uh, pro 
probably for understandable reasons. And um, we also found that w uh, there was great agreement um, if um, the verb practical construction was used in a given way by the adults, the children, or also using them uh, in the same way. Even though there could be intervening material between the verb and the particle, most of them were uh, quite uh, adjacent. The other interesting thing about um, uh, idiomatic expressions or multi-word expressions for uh, human speakers is that we see uh, different degrees of acceptability by different groups of speakers. So, for example, native speakers are a lot more picky about what they consider to be a good use of a multi-word expression than non-native speakers. So, we are a bit more relaxed and we would accept some variation even for even if there is a marked preference for native speakers by one form or another. So, for example, kick the bucket is a traditional case in English, which is uh, said to be very big, so you can't say that somebody, uh, somebody died if um, the, 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 kick was, uh, the bucket was kicked by this person. So, you can only use this uh, expression in the active form if you want to convey the meaning of dying. So, somebody kicked the bucket may mean somebody died. But for non-native speakers, they may be a bit more uh, flexible in what they um, they accept. And uh, one thing that we that we did was to adopt a protocol for uh, uh, judgments about compositionality, um, where uh, we asked people to judge compound nouns like police car, and we asked them to judge not compositionality and idiomaticity because then there would be a long discussion with our non-expert annotators explain the concepts, but we asked them to judge how literal the words were in relation to the expression. So, for example, for police car, we asked, is police literally related to police? Is police in police car literally related to police? Is it literally related to car? Is it a car used by the police? So, we did this rephrasing and we asked the annotators to use this um, six-point Likert scale. Uh, to say if they agreed that that was the case or if they didn't agree. And we also asked them to provide synonyms for the, the uh, noun compounds that were seen there. So here's just a, a, a quick uh, example of what we asked our annotators to do. So in a sentence involving climate change as a compound like this one, police designed to encourage adaptation to climate change, make conflict with blah, blah, blah. So we ask, is in, in this sentence climate change truly literally a change in climate? So we did this and we collected judgments for compounds in English, French, and Portuguese. And we fixed the kind of compounds that we were looking at to be two word noun compounds um, and the equivalent expressions in Portuguese and in French. Um, and we uh, adopted um, a protocol that had been devised by uh, Reggie, um, Super Reggie, Diana McCarthy um, uh, colleagues, and we extended it to, to English and to two um, sets of Portuguese and French. And what we did when we were collecting these judgments to be able to compare perceptions about idiomaticity is that we balanced uh, the compounds that we used to be one third uh, fully idiomatic, one third fully compositional, and one third partly compositional. So then we could see if there were differences in judgments and perceptions for each of these three in the three languages. And for English, we uh, collected this data using mechanical curve. But for Portuguese, we could get very few native speaker annotators in mechanical curve. So we had to go back to our students, linguists, and computer scientists. Uh, but what, it ha what happened was then we were able to calculate the agreement um, using our Portuguese annotators as, um, as, um, as the basis. So, to give you an idea of the difficulty of the task and the level of agreement that they could obtain, for Portuguese, the um, alpha score um, between one annotator and the same annotator one month later, um, the score was 0.59. So, the same person had a 0.69 score and this was um, uh, an expert annotator, uh, a translator specialized in multi-word expressions. So I think he was quite upset when he saw the, the result. 
Uh, and this corresponds to a 0.77 Spearman correlation agreement. So you can see it's a hard task, and even depending on the day, people may change their perceptions. And to give you an idea about the, the level of um, uh, variation that we had in our annotations, in here you can see the, the chart for the standard deviation uh, among the annotators for French compounds. So in the X, you have the 180 compounds plotted, and in the Y, you can see the standard deviation. So the more standard deviation, the more the, there was variation in the judgments of the annotators. And what we found was that the annotators had uh, really a high level of agreement in the extreme. So if something was really idiomatic or really compositional, they were very sure about that. And they had most of the differences in the, in the middle, if something was partly compositional. Because this Likert scale from zero to six, they may think, okay, maybe it's a two, maybe it's a three. There was some divergence there. Uh, but uh, luckily, when we plotted the, the same 180 compounds in terms of the composition, the average compositionality score that we obtained, we could see this very nice diagonal line here which more or less um, uh, reflected well the expectations we had for one third of them compositional, one third idiomatic, and one third in the middle. Uh, question. Of course. Uh, I just want to jump on the line. Um, I was doing the working group so that it is in the beginning. So given a phrase, I would expect that there is a true value when there is a very large scale. I know my paper should select that true value and then you miss that from that and then there's an error. Or does that reflect a uh, word that has some deviation of the right there? Is a word that some people might truly find to be non idiomatic or idiomatic, some people might be in that case and push the word. Whereas on the left, there is a word that is consistently consistent idiomatic or consistent with the That's a really good point, and surprisingly, it tends to be a bit subjective. So one of the cases that we were looking at, there was lots of disagreement, were dirty words. Dirty words, some people from the synonyms, we could see that some people actually um, consider that to be very, actually, uh, an extended sense of dirt, like metaphorical dirt, so for, for swear word. And some people really thought, okay, this dirty word is not, it's very, very dramatic. So there was some subject, subjectivity there. Uh, the cases where people had very little disagreement were things like graduate student. Everybody agreed that a graduate student was a student during graduate study. But things like, um, I think, gold mine, um, fish story, and dirty word were cases where people had more, more disagreement. And sometimes it's very, sometimes it's, um, um, little disagreement between a two and a three for neighboring scores. But sometimes it's about perception, like there to work. Sorry, sorry, I shouldn't have this up. Can we get to the end? Because the other one, my audience might be able to hear this question that I can repeat them again. Oh, thank you. So we'll go back to that. But um, the, what we also found was that there was an asymmetric impact. So if there was one word in the compound that was perceived to be idiomatic, then the whole compound was judged to be more idiomatic uh, than, than the influence of the compositional word in the compound. Um, and we um, annotated also some of these uh, compounds in terms of what the synonyms, in terms of what kind of replacements they had for the compound noun that they had. So for Portuguese, we actually uh, took the synonyms and we said, okay, this is a strict synonym, this is a, a, a paraphrase, this is a definition, and this is a, a, a synonym involving multi-word expression. So we annotated this very carefully, and it's uh, available. So for now, we did this for Portuguese, and uh, this is um, a resource that can be used, for example, to judge machine translation and text simplification. If you are interested, it's all freely available, and we are happy to share the data. Um, and now, now that we have this data set, then the next, um, the next step was to actually check how models would perceive the same task and how they would fare. Um, so we used um, traditional vector space models, which adopt the, the, the principle that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. 
So you, you think that words are characterized by the context in which they appear and that similar context are reflecting similar meanings. So then what you can do is to, you can plot the, the, each of the words according to their context in this multidimensional space. And you can assume that, for example, if two words are closed in the space, they have very similar meanings. And you can do all sorts of uh, interesting uh, operations on words, uh, treating them as vectors. So using cosine similarity, for example, for multi word expressions, one standard approach that has been used in the area is that you, you take the sum of the component words, in this case, for example, the sum of police and car, and you compare with a single representation that you create for this compound. So for example, if my corpus was the three sentences here, I would uh, treat car separately where it appears on its own, police separately where it appears on its own, but I would treat police car as a single token, as if it was a, um, a single word. And then what we do is we compare um, the representation for police car, the dedicated one, with the sum of the individual vectors. And then you see how far they are um, in this multidimensional space. If they are close together, we assume that they are compositional. And if they are further apart, like in this case for ivory tower to mean a state of isolation, then we would assume that they are idiomatic. And using this very simple assumption, then we tested um, some static models to start with because they are the ones that we can, um, that are much more transparent and that you can understand, uh, read better the results that they are giving you. So uh, in the case for English, for example, we um, uh, uh, tested uh, models like what to back and gloves, so you can see them in the, in the X axis. Um, and we looked at the um, experimental correlation that they had with the human judgments. And what we found was that they actually did a pretty decent job. And we got uh, around 0.80 correlation, experimental correlation for most of the models. Um, and we found the same for French and Portuguese. And um, so for French and Portuguese, they were slightly lower correlations. Um, and for Portuguese, it was around 0.60. But if you remember that I told you before that the same expert annotator got 0.77 spearman correlation with himself, the models aren't doing a bad job. Interestingly enough, the model that did better for English, which was word to fact, was not the one that did better for Portuguese and English. So for Portuguese and English, we took traditional, a traditional model developed by the Kangli in the 90s, 2000s, and it was the one who did better. So for an old timer like me, it's actually quite nice to see that the traditional models still do well. And, um, and then we um, decided to check if the contextualized uh, word embedding models were doing better. Because the idea there is that they have dedicated representations for different usages of the same word. And they seem to be quite um, closely uh, correlated and aligned with the different senses of these words. So we thought, okay, maybe these um, embeddings are much better at detecting the idiomatic usage versus the literal usage of an expression. And these are models like um, GPT-2, GPT-3, BERT, all the BERT family. Um, and uh, we would expect then to have uh, the representation of cloud, for example, um, on its own, um, like a vapor, um, I don't know, physical entity, and cloud in cloud nine as being closest to, to um, the vector of happiness, for example. So, and this we called our Lieutenant Commander Data um, test for word embeddings. And let's see if this works. Can you guess what uh, he was talking about? Uh, okay, let's go back and go farther. Okay, I'll um, relieve you of your suspense. That means a wild goose shape. 
So uh, what uh, what he did there was to use the paraphrases or the literal synonyms of each of the words in the expression. And that's what we decided to do for our models. We decided to see if they could detect these perturbations from an original expression to uh, uh, replacements that we did there. So we took uh, the three naturalistic corpus sentences that we used in the previous judgment. And what we did was to take each of the compounds that we tested, like in this case, armchair critic, and we replaced it by the gold standard synonym that the annotators provided. In this case, it would be a bystander, for example. So we um, had a, a version of the sentence which was the same, just with a synonym replaced. And then we did our our um, lieutenant commander data perturbations, where we used, for example, just one of the words of the compound. Uh, so in, in the previous sentence, we asked if she could not just be an armchair. And for compositional cases that might or might not be, um, be uh, work, but for idiomatic cases, it definitely doesn't work. And then we also replaced each of the words by the synonym independently. So we replaced armchair by recliner and critic by judge. And we wanted to see if the models would um, be able to perceive these differences in meaning. And we also had a neutral sentence there where we said this is A or N, and then we had the compound, just to see if we could tell what was the default representation that the model would give. Okay, and we manually revised this variance to remove any kind of agreement issues and so on. So we ended up with over 5,000 sentences for English and over uh, 3,000 for Portuguese. And we only tested with these two languages. But the results were, uh, were very clear for the two of them. So the, the test that we did was, uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, to see if the models would be able to perceive that a sentence is the same if you use the compound or the gold synonym. And uh, in the case of, for example, economic aid, which is a very compositional case, we would expect the model to perceive a sentence using financial system as being a synonym. And in the case of an idiomatic expression, again, because we were using the gold standard uh, synonym. So, for example, for something like brain matter, we would expect the model to perceive brain as the same. And I'm glad to tell you that when we compare the cosine similarities here for different models in the x-axis, so from Glove, Elmo, uh, more static, partially uh, in contextualized and then very contextualized models. And the cosine similarity between the sentence and the variation. So all of the, um, the models perceived this to be the case. So they, they uh, passed this first test, gave us high cosine similarities. Uh, but they seemed to think that this was related to idiomaticity, which it wasn't because the gold standard synonym is the gold standard synonym for idiomatic and for compositional cases. And then we asked, okay, can the model perceive um, when the, the, the expression is a synonym with just one of the words? So we took the word of the compound that had the closest, the highest similarity with um, the compound. In this case, for example, uh, for economic aid, we would select aid because it was the most similar. And uh, for something like an idiomatic compound, no matter which word uh, you select, both of them would be bad. So for gray matter, you can replace gray matter as uh, brain, either for gray or for matter. Uh, but funnily enough, the models seem to think that they were synonyms in all cases. And in here, you can see the results in blue for English and the results in orange for Portuguese. And they are basically the same tendency. And all the similarities between the sentence and these perturbations are uh, both the 90s. So the models seem to think that um, gray matter is um, equivalent to matter or gray matter is equivalent to gray. And uh, the, the, there were high um, similarities across the idiomatic spectrum. So then we did our uh, third test, which was to replace the compound by the synonyms of the individual words. So in the case of economic um, aid, it would be financial help, so it works because it's more compositional. But in the case of gray matter, it would be off-white subject, right? And in, for, so our expectation was that it could work for compositional cases, but the model shouldn't think that the idiomatic replacements uh, were similar. 
But once again, when we looked at the similarities, all very high similarities there for both languages. Um, and we decided to look, okay, is the context actually being informative in this case? So we compared uh, the similarities that the model would give for the compound noun um, coming from a sentence. So we extracted the representation, for example, for economic aid in this sentence. And we compared, compared with the representation for econ economic aid as if it was a single sentence. So a sentence containing just the words of the compound. And we did the same for uh, compositional for compositional and idiomatic cases. And once again, the, there were very high similarities between a compound and the compound coming from the, the sentential context across the compositionality spectrum for the two languages. So it seems that somehow the models are not able to tell how they should use the context to actually disambiguate when something is similar or not. So um, this, this is something that has been um, noted in the, the literature for other uh, scenarios, not only with multi-word expressions that we um, tested, but in general. So it seems that contextualized word embeddings, they um, tend to make an anisotropic um, vector space. So all the, the similarities are concentrating, all the representations are concentrating in a very narrow cone in this multidimensional space. So everything that you compare with everything else is going to give you a high similarity. So um, the, the, they are, seem to be using the lexical overlap between the, the, our perturbations as the wrong key for similarity. So they seem to think that poison pill meaning emergency exit is the same as pill when it isn't. So this is good news for us because it means that we still have a long way to go before we, uh, these models are actually uh, treating idiomatistical records. So we have an opportunity here for training the models how they should uh, learn these expressions. But a cautionary tale too, because if people are using the, the models and the representations as they are to do, for example, machine translation or to do any kind of inference, they are treating a, a poison pill like a pill, which is not, um, not a good outcome. Um, and since then, we um, investigated even further um, these cases, for example, looking at fine-grained um, uh, senses for each of these expressions. So something like gold mine, for example, not only as a literal gold mine where you remove minerals, but as a very profitable, um, very profitable uh, business, or as a um, uh, a gold mine like a movie, for example. So some of these can have different senses. Some, some of the idiomatic senses may be polysemic and the same for the, the literal ones. And we uh, proposed a shared task in SEMEVAL 2022, task number two, uh, with two subtasks. One of them was to detect if a sentence contained idiomatic expressions or not. Um, and the second one, which was to tell us what representation the idiomatic expression had in a sentence. And we did a test more or less like the one that I described before, where we uh, gave a sentence containing a potentially uh, idiomatic expression, like big fish in this case. And we asked the models to tell us if big fish was closer was more similar to a replacement like fish, which was the right one for this sentence, than to um, uh, the same sentence containing important person, which was the gold synonym, but for the idiomatic case. Um, and this uh, task was offered in English, Portuguese, and Galician, and we had over 100 participants and 25 teams participating on it. Um, and the, the task was presented in LACO this year, so just to give you an idea of the different uh, solutions that uh, the teams propose, most of them in, um, involved one of the variants of birth, but there were also um, some competitive solutions, for example, with word to vet, with CNN, and so on. Um, and most of the, um, the methods employed uh, uh, involved some kind of data augmentation or some uh, modification to the loss function um, that the models were learning from. So, and what we found, which was really uh, interesting as far as we are concerned, is that the teams who did well in task A 
didn't do so well in class B, and the teams who did well in the zero shot didn't do so well in the one shot. So we are still trying to figure out why this is happening, but we are thinking that one shot, the system has seen at least one example of the idiomatic expression. So the systems who did well there tended to have really large models that memorize these concepts. But in the zero shot where the expression was not necessarily seen, the models who did, uh, which did well needed some more generalization abilities to know that there was something strange going on. So we are still um, finding, uh, trying to understand uh, what were the, the big winners there. But it's published, the shared test data is still available if you are intrigued by this and would like to participate. Um, the data is all there and uh, you can still evaluate your system. So I encourage you to do that. Um, so what, um, what I presented here to you was some uh, evaluation that we did with current models to see how they, they uh, interpreted expressions. And unfortunately, they are still misled by lexical similarity. And our, our own intuition as um, you know, humans uh, has been that um, idioms are very culturally specific and they are um, language specific as well. So sometimes you have a multi-word expression, uh, meaning um, a concept in one language, and you might be lucky enough that it's translated by exactly the same way in another language, but it might be translated to something different, like a, a literal paraphrase, or it might be another different multi-word expression. So it's a challenge for machines, and it's a challenge for human um, language learners. And um, if you want to know a bit more, if you want to test your idiomaticity skills, in EACL 2021, we proposed a language diversity panel and language diversity games. And one of the games is the one that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation, was to try to guess the meaning of an expression in one language based only on the words um, and the individual translation. And I'm glad to say that since I started working on the topic, the topic uh, had a, um, a really nice growth. And there are initiatives like, for example, cost action. Um, so there was a part in the action a few years ago which produced really, really valuable data. So corpus annotations for over 20 languages for potentially um, idiomatic verbal expressions. And the uh, action now has a follow-up, uh, which um, is related to um, uh, dependency parsing. So it's the cost action uni dive, universality, diversity, and idiosyncrasy in language technology. And you can guess that the idiosyncrasy is the most toward the expression aspect. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, please get in touch because we are, uh, the action just started and we are still um, looking for interested people for example, um, uh, in the UK to join the action. So if you are interested, you, um, you can get in touch with me and I'll uh, nominate you for the action. Um, and more recently, actually next week, we are going to have the figurative language workshop. And they also propose a shared test there about uh, figurative language understanding and inference. So one of the, um, the shared tasks um, was involved, for example, with uh, determining if a given sentence uh, had uh, an entailment, a contradiction uh, involving metaphors, sarcasm, idiomatic expressions, and a few more figurative um, phenomena. And the systems also needed to provide an explanation for the label that they were providing there. So it wasn't enough to say, okay, this is a contradiction. They needed to say why, verbalize an explanation. Um, and a few months ago, um, with some colleagues, uh, with uh, Carlos Hamish, Marco Diak, and Harish Madabushi, uh, we gave a tutorial in calling and another one in LREC. Um, and the materials are available if you are interested, just get in touch. So the work that I described here was done uh, for a long time and with wonderful colleagues um, throughout this time and sponsored by both from uh, Brazilian funding agency, Sansom Research, and uh, currently by an EPSRC project. And I'm delighted to say that I'm, um, the problem is still not solved, so we have future projects um, that I hope will be coming our way uh, on this topic.
And with this, um, I'll uh, open for questions. And in the meantime, I'll leave you with some, um, some more interesting expressions from German this time. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, the floor is uh, open to questions. And online as well, if you want to send your... Uh, if there is... Uh, because I cannot see, of course, what's happening there. <laughs> um, I have a question um, for, for you, Alina. Thanks for the talk. I was wondering, you mentioned uh, the different contextual representations, and um, I was wondering for the compositionality, uh, to what extent injecting more syntactic knowledge in the contextual representations it would be of interest and would improve uh, uh, the recognition of uh, compositional? Sophia, many thanks. This is a really insightful question, and um, it actually touches on a, a, an important point. So there are some um, clues coming from the context that we use when we interpret these expressions. And in particular, uh, for example, the verbs that occur with the compound noun in this case, or the, the other nouns surrounding it. So one of the words that we are doing is actually to try to um, inject this uh, co contextual knowledge into the models to say, don't pay attention so much to the words that are being used in this case, either beaver or cloud noun, but pay more attention to the relevant con context around it. Mm -hmm. So we are still, um, um, this is still ongoing work, and one of my PhD students is also collecting some eye-tracking data from human participants to see if we can uh, inject this knowledge in different ways, either from um, using, let's say, uh, synthetic information about the words, or by checking what people pay attention to when they interpret this expression. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a slightly different, which I was talking, what you're saying is more advanced. I was taking a bit more, um, a sim more simple approach of injecting the syntactic information, but um, you're right, because using attention, you can uh, incorporate other types of information of how people have a reading as well, etc. cetera. Um, I, I was wondering if there are any questions that, uh, from the audience, if from the... Um... Yes, exactly, walking on a mountain. <laughs> That's a really, really important. Are you able to summarize the question for the online sure. audience? I couldn't follow it. It's above my head. So the question was um, how we can, um, let's say, interpret the original sentence for machine translation to be more uh, accurate, and what kind of information we can provide to a system, yeah? how we can um, uh, train models. So this is a this is actually an open problem because the for the, the the systems they seem to work really well but we don't know why they they are a black box and the reason why we decided to do from the more conventional static models like for example PMI is because we can interpret them there is so the vectors are composed by dimensions and the dimensions are words. So I can say, okay, this particular word is really influencing the 
the interpretation of this particular move to work. But of course, you can't do that anymore with uh, neural models because you don't know what the dimensions represent. So one of the things that um, we um, try to do here is actually to assess to what extent they were really understanding. Because they are so good and we don't know what they are doing. So are they doing, are they getting to one uh, answer because they really know what they are doing, because they really understand, or are they getting there by accident? And if you change slightly and do an adversarial example, will they still have the same perception? So um, it's an open question, and um, if you have any uh, ideas about how to do that, please come and talk to me because uh, we are definitely interested. So one, one possibility that I thought would be to first translate uh, within the same language, so do monolingual translation, of an expression to the synonym or to whatever, and then from there, from the literal uh, synonym, go into the translation. is how uh, much the system can learn, how much training is needed. So the, in software engineering back uh, in the day, the, the, there used to be a saying that says garbage in, garbage out. And, if, and we see this, for example, in the bias that our models pick up from text, if the text is just as it is. So, um, the better quality data and the better quality training data you have, the, that's, the, that's what, uh, what you need to test. It depends on the particular task and it depends on the particular phenomenon. If it's very rare, it's more, more frequent depending on its complexity. So the million dollar question is how much training data do I need for my task? And um, it's an open it's an open problem. Depends on the task, depends on the um, on, on the phenomena, the frequency. Uh, the Maybe we can pick on this question yeah, afterwards, yeah, so I, I'm happy to talk to you later. So we had another question here. Thank you very much. Uh, I see there are a lot of modules in my college. Yes. Uh, in the middle of two parts, one of the elements is what part of the massive module of technique. The first one is if you're given a module of technique on a chipboard and the model asks you, okay, so it's very cheap. And 
very bad underlying relation between the focus of very bad. And the second task is given a model expression and another word could be modeled for a function. And a model output for a model has a substantial relation. So somebody talked a lot about knowing how the security is a good method for having an area of how it is a and there are very much about the method. So, um, uh, this, what you were asking is about the generalization. Let me just check how much time we have so that we don't. Uh, like we have uh, two minutes before we wrap up, but um, yeah. So, I'll, I'll give the show. You can, you can have another few minutes because we started late. So, maybe another five minutes would be fine. Thank you. So the, the question is if the models can also go over similar tasks beyond these uh, two tasks that I described, uh, this task involving synonyms. And this is a really important uh, question because we don't know how much the models are actually generalizing. And if you test a particular example and the model may know that example, it doesn't mean that it's going to know a similar example where you just slightly changed and that's why um, the work on adversarial um, adversarial um, learning is actually so important because sometimes you you change something that people would naturally perceive but the model doesn't perceive or the other way around you change something that people don't perceive like in adversarial training uh, you you see two pictures and they are the same, but some of the pixels have been changed, and that's enough for the models to understand that the two figures are different. So in in this case here, what we did was on the spirit of adversarial training and to see if the models perceive this perturbation, and they they didn't. So the next question is how much generalization ability can we expect these models to actually have, or something like multi-level expansion? The fact that you as a human know a given expression doesn't mean that when you see another different expression, you will also know it. You know that there is something a bit strange when you hear a new expression, but it may take you a few sentences to determine the meaning of that expression. So it's, it's I think it's a different kind of generalization when we are talking about these expressions that we are um, from what we have been measuring in our models. That makes sense, but I'm uh, happy to take the questions afterwards. So thank you so much, uh, Sophia, Matthew, for thank the you, Lida, and uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll pick up. We'll discuss later on. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't, you know, uh, un unforeseen circumstances. Um, so thank you very much for the very exciting talk. It's it's great to to hear about these problems which actually they've been very old in <laughs> translation and uh, we're still trying to figure it out. They're very difficult as well. <laughs> so um... <laughs> They're still not solved, so still scope for projects, right? Yeah. So uh, thank you again uh, very much for your time. And please, I hope there are several people there. I don't know how many people are present um, to, um, to discuss with you further. And I definitely discuss with you um, uh, very, very soon. Thanks again, Alina. Take care. Bye. Bye.